Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm really, really pleased to introduce to you um, Loretta Napoleoni today. Um, Loretta is a writer, journalist, and economist. Um, she is the leading expert um, on the relation between um, our economies and terror. And that's what she's going to discuss with us um, today. Um, we will have a 30 minutes in discussion and then another 30 minutes for, um, for a Q&A. Um, I believe we have uh, a lot to learn from Loretta's, um, well, from this session today and from her books. So um, I hope you and Loretta as well will enjoy the session. And so uh, join me in welcoming her and uh, thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for being here today. So what I'm going to do is um, to tell you a story. And through this story, I will show you how terrorism and the economy are actually intertwined. In particular, what I want to put forward to you is how the war on terror, which was launched by George Bush after 9-11, has caused uh, the credit crunch, the recession, and all the tribulations of the current economy. Um, and finally, at the end of this speech, we'll have a look at uh, the future. And the danger is that the consequences of this war on terror may actually be much more serious uh, than the crisis that we have witnessed until today. Now, the reason why I told you I'll tell you a story is because um, I think in order for you to understand what is the economics of terrorism, I have to start uh, from uh, the beginning. Uh, otherwise, you won't understand how this economy actually has developed. Um, and uh, I will tell you my personal story, because uh, it did happen to me uh, about uh, 15 years ago to stumble into the economics of terrorism. It's not something that uh, I wanted to discover or something that I was working on. Um, in fact, at the time, I was working as a banker in the city of London. So it all happened about uh, 15 years ago. I got a phone call from a friend uh, who was looking after the rights of political prisoners in Italy. In particular, we're talking about the Red Brigades. The Red Brigades was the armed organization which was particularly strong in Italy from the 60s to the 80s. Uh, it was a Marxist organization. and. <clears throat> One of their characteristics was not to talk to anybody, including their lawyers. So they sat through the trials uh, without saying one single word. So it was a bit of a mystery how the Red Brigades came about, uh, uh, how they were organized. Uh, so in 1992, they declared the end of the armed struggle, and they decided that they would tell the story of how the organization was formed to a group of people. And they made a list of people, and I was one of the people in the list. Now, you'd be surprised, as I was surprised myself. Um, but the reason why I ended up in that list is because my childhood friend became a leader of the Red Brigade. So she was arrested in 1978. I discovered it uh, by opening the newspaper. And here was her picture. Um, I didn't know anything. She had never actually spoke to me about uh, her political conviction. And um, to me, she was a you know, perfectly normal individual. And yet, she was one of the leaders of the Red Brigade. So I stayed in touch with her. Uh, but we never spoke about politics at all, because she was one of the unrepentant members of the organization. So she was uh, bound to silence. Uh, Anyway, in 1992, when they decided that the armed struggle had finished, she put my name forward. And a group of female members of the Red Brigades actually backed my name as a you know, potential person to talk to, because they had met me uh, at the time. I was a, a leader of the Italian feminist movement. Of course, I didn't know that they were members of the Red Brigades. This is the life we lived in the 1970s in Italy. You know, your best friend being a terrorist, and you didn't know. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, now this uh, proposal came at a very difficult time in my life because uh, I'd just done a management buyout of the company I worked with. So 
uh, I was very busy at the time. Plus, you know, I just had the baby. So that was the last thing I wanted to do was, you know, to go back to Italy and tour all the high security prisons, uh, meeting people I hadn't seen since the 1970s. But in the end, uh, I actually decided to do it. And the reason why I did it is because I wanted to know why my best friend from you know, the age of six had never tried to recruit me. Why she actually never asked me to become a member of the Red Brigade. Now, you'll be surprised again, but the truth is that at that time, the way the armed organization worked was to recruit people primarily among members of the family and best friends. So why not me? So I went back, and uh, I learned very, very quickly why I was not recruited. Uh, I actually had failed the psychological profile of a terrorist. Uh, so there's a group of people who decide if you are the right person to be recruited or not. So it came out that I was too single-minded and too opinionated to make a good soldier, which is true. So, but it was at that point that Actually, I realized that perhaps terrorism was something totally different from what uh, I had uh, read in newspapers or what we actually had discussed uh, in the 1970s. So I got more and more into investigating uh, why they recruit people and once they recruit people, what do these people actually do? And what I discovered is that in reality, um, a terrorist organization is run like an army. There's a very small group of people, the leaders who actually run the show. All the others uh, follow orders. And these orders uh, are always based upon searching for money. So what the average terrorist does uh, all day long is find money in order to fund the organization. There's no discussion about ideology. There's no discussion about politics. Because once you get in, you're already indoctrinated. So when I was asking uh, um, members of the Red Brigades uh, why they decided to fight against the state uh, in a certain way, they actually didn't really know how to answer me because they had no idea. I mean, of course, the leaders was a different thing. But you know, the people they actually did carry out the attacks on a daily basis, they had no idea. Once I start asking them, well, so tell me how did you manage to get the money? How did you fund the organization? Then they were really happy to talk to me. So some of the stories were amazing. I mean, for example, there was one guy who was um, a psychiatrist. He was a part-timer. The Red Brigades had uh, um, 500 full-timers uh, at any time. And then they had about 2,000 part-timers. So people that basically did uh, um, carried out a normal life, and then they helped the Red Brigades on the side. So he loved sailing. So he had the beautiful sailing boat. So what he did in the summer was to sail back and forth from Italy to Lebanon, pick up the weapons from the PLO, which of course you know, came from the Soviet Union, carry back the weapons in Sardinia. And then various organizations, uh, for example, ETA or the IRA, would come and pick up their share of these weapons. And for this service, the Red Brigades received a fee. So he was very happy to tell me that, because he thought you know, it was a great idea. Plus, you know, he was having a great time sailing. So this is when I thought, well, maybe there is something more to terrorism than ideology. Maybe what I really need to investigate is the economics of terrorism. So the idea to actually do a research in this field came after I had lunch with Mario Moretti. Mario Moretti was the, the leader of the Red Brigades when Aldo Moro, the former prime minister of Italy, was kidnapped. He was actually the guy who executed him. So I had lunch with him in one of these high security prisons. And while I was talking to him, I know it's, uh, but this is why I want to tell you this story, because it's an amazing story. So while I was having lunch with him, I had the distinct feeling that I was back in the city of London having lunch with a banker. This guy spoke the language of finance so well. I mean, the way he expressed himself, he was you know, a true manager. And he was ex explaining to me how he was managing his company, which happened to be called the Red Brigades. 
So this is what I thought, well, that's it. This is what I should be doing. Uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I mean, I'm trained to think in economic terms. I worked for a long time in the city. So this is when I began my investigation. And uh, I must tell you, it was very difficult to find anybody to uh, fund my research until 9-11, because everybody thought that was completely insane to talk about the economics of terrorism. So I funded myself, and, um, and I did the right thing. So what did I discover? Well, I discovered that since uh, World War II, an economic system has been created by armed organization. And this economic system uh, has gone through three major evolutionary stages. The first one is the state sponsor of terrorism. The second one is the privatization of terrorism. And the third one is the globalization of terrorism. So to a certain extent, this economy has been following the evolution of the international economy and eventually of the globalized economy. So what is the state sponsor of terrorism? Well, this is when the two superpowers were fighting a war by proxy. Uh, using fully funded armed organization uh, at the fringes uh, of the sphere of influence that they controlled. So we're talking about you know, the Soviet Union on one side and the United States on the other side. So wh what was the modality? Well, basically, these armed organizations were funded with legal and illegal activities. And I think the best example, of course, is the Contras in Nicaragua. So we have the US Congress who actually funded a certain amount of money to support what were considered freedom fighters. And then because this money were not enough, we have the Reagan administration who launched a series of covert operation in order to fund them. So that's the mix that we basically you know, find. So another interesting characteristic of this um, stage is the fact that these groups, these armed organizations, in reality did not fight their own wars, but they fought this war by proxy. So they basically fought whatever the superpower, the sponsor, wanted them to fight. Now, this situation changed at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, uh, when uh, terrorism was privatized. And the um, guy that actually did the first privatization was Arafat. So he managed to gain independence from his sponsor by setting up the same kind of system, so a mix of legal and illegal activities, but controlled by his own organization, so by the PLO. Now, and the results were fantastic. I mean, we see that, for example, um, there are some documents coming from the CIA where they list uh, the amount of money that actually are produced on an yearly basis by the PLO and is higher than the GDP of some of you know, the small Arab countries. So, so they actually did very, very well. So this is the face of the privatization of terrorism. Um, another example nearer to London, for example, is the IRA. IRA did the same thing. So we, s we saw that um, the IRA controlled all the transportation, the private transportation system in Northern Ireland. So every time somebody got into a taxi in Belfast without knowing, it was actually funding you know, the IRA. The orange were in the construction business. So every time somebody actually remodeled its flat in Northern Ireland, in reality was funding you know, the, the orange group. So th this is how much terrorist organization managed to penetrate the legal economy, the everyday um, economy. So the last evolutionary stages uh, is the one that we know better, which is, of course, the globalization of terrorism, because this is the one that created an organization like Al Qaeda. Now, that happened in the 1990s with the deregulation of the international financial system. All the barriers came down, so countries I mean, um, armed organizations were able to link up with each other in a much better way than the one I just described to you about sharing arms. So they started to do business uh, with each other, but also they started to do business uh, together with criminal organizations. They money launder their dirty profits through the same channels. So we see the birth of a new um, international economic system. Now, Al Qaeda is very much the stereotype of this new face because it is an organization which was able to fund itself uh, cross-border. So the portfolio 
of somebody like Osama bin Laden was an international portfolio. But so was the portfolio of Arafat. But the difference is that, of course, Arafat was focused on one single part of the world, which was, of course, you know, Lebanon and Palestine, while Osama bin Laden was actually looking at the global world. So in other words, 9-11 was a transnational attack, which was funded in different parts of the world. It was uh, put together, it was planned in one part of the world, Afghanistan, and it was carried out uh, in a different countries in the United States. Now, we have never seen anything like that. So that is the, the product of this globalization of terrorism. So what I did uh, before 9-11, I actually calculated the size of this economy. So, and this is an economy where we find three main components. So the first component is uh, the illegal economy, um, which is described as capital flights. Uh, this is a jargon to describe money they move from countries to countries undetected, unreported, and illegally. So bribes, uh, which go from one country to another, but also tax evasion gets calculated into this. So, and this is $500 billion. Then there is, there is the gross criminal product. These are money generated by, by um, criminal organizations across the world. So we have it from petty crime to organized crime, which is another $500 billion. And then we have what I have defined as the new economy of terrorism. So these are money which are generated uh, only by armed organizations. And one part is, of course, illegal. Uh, but one part, which is about you know, one third, is actually produced by legitimate businesses. Uh, so people that mm, are part of an armed organization who fund this organization through help from families, for example, but also through you know, work that they carried out. Uh, and I think a good example of this is the attack that was carried out uh, on July 7 in London um, whereby <laughs> most of the funding was uh, legitimate. Uh, people had either worked, used their salaries, or used you know, help from their friends. So there was no criminal um, money coming in in order to fund this attack. So um, in total, we're talking about $1.5 trillion, which is about 5% of the world economy, as it was in, in the year 2000, or um, more than the GDP of the United Kingdom. So we're talking about a lot of money. Now, what was interesting, actually, is that when I went to look at uh, where do this money get recycled? Because, you know, of course, most of this money is dirty money. So one way or another, it has to be washed somewhere. So what I found out, that the majority of this money was denominated in US dollar, and it was actually money laundered inside the United States. So. This has very serious implications in economic terms. Uh, I'll try to explain to you. If you don't understand in the question and answer, you can ask me. But what's happening is that this, imagine all this $1.5 trillion moving every year inside the United States. Now, this goes straight into the US economy. So it actually sustains the US economy. But more to the point, because it sustains the US economy, so it helps the US economy to grow, it has an impact upon the US money supply. The US money supply is the amount of cash that every year is printed by the Federal Reserve in order to meet the demand coming from the economy. So the higher the growth of the economy, the higher will be the number of banknotes that the Federal Reserves will print. So I went to look at the US money supply to see what was happening because, of course, what I thought is if this money come in and have to be money laundered, one way or another, some of this money have to come out in order to go back to the origin. So imagine a Colombia drug dealer. You know, he wants his money back. He wants his profit. He's not going to invest all the money in the US. Part of it has to come back. And then with those money, of course, he will buy weapons. So with those money, he will sustain the growth of the illegal terror and criminal economy, our 1.5 trillion dollars. So I went to look at the US money supply figure and what I noticed is that from the 1960s uh, onwards uh, an increasing amount of cash uh, which is printed every year left the United States uh, 
never to come back. Now, these are money that are taken out to the U.S. in suitcases or bulk shipment or in containers. And I discover that many economists from the Federal Reserve had written extensively on the topic, warning the government that something was majorly wrong. Where are all this money going? And of course, this money went to fund the terror, criminal, and illegal economy. So this is how the circle of you know, money actually gets closed. But what is very interesting is the fact that the United States uh, as a country was benefiting from this flow of money, not only because uh, the money were coming in to be money launder, but above all, because the United States can borrow against the total amount of dollars in circulation in the entire world, not only against the amount of dollars uh, in circulation inside the United States. And this is because the U.S. is the reserve, I mean the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. This privilege in economics is called the senior age. So the country that has the reserve currency can borrow against the total volume of dollars. So this is explain why the United States can have a debt which is enormous in terms of any other nation, but it is allowed because the U.S. has the dollar. So you see how important is the dollar for the U.S.? <laughs> so um, what this research implied is the fact that in reality, um, the United States had been borrowing against the growth of the legal, criminal, and above all, terror economy. So it was actually borrowing against its own, the growth of the economy run by its own enemies. So <clears throat> this was quite shocking. Uh, and, um, but the situation changed uh, with the introduction of the Patriot Act. See, after 9-11, if you remember, in October um, 2001, the U.S. passed a legislation which was called the Patriot Act that reduces greatly the rights of citizens inside the U.S. in order to protect them against terrorists. But there is a section which is a financial section. In this financial section, um, what the... Um, the government actually imposed is um, a prohibition to all U.S. banks and U.S. registered banks uh, to do business with offshore facilities, uh, so offshore banks. That means that it block the entry of all these dollars uh, into the United States. So it was in reality an anti-money laundering legislation. Um, at the same time, it also gave the U.S. Monetary Authority the power to monitor all dollar transactions taking place all over the world. Now, the Patriot Act um, completely changed the way um, money flow from one country to another country. Um, and I explain you why. Um, it was, first of all, extremely unpopular among international banks because you know, nobody wants the US authority to monitor what you're doing with your client. It, plus, of course, uh, in, according to the Patriot Act, uh, if a bank failed to report uh, of uh, suspicious transactions uh, taking place anywhere in the world in dollars, uh, uh, it could be criminally persecuted. Now, you may remember that there are several banks, uh, for example, Lloyd's and US and UBS, uh, who actually have been fined by the U.S. authority on the basis of the Patriot Act. So what did the banks actually do? The banks started to advise uh, their clients to get out of the dollar investment into euro investment. And that explains why all of a sudden from October 2001, the euro starts shooting up and the dollar starts falling. Now, the same thing, of course, happened with illegal kind of and, and criminal money. I mean, you know, the criminal organization did exactly the same thing. They said, okay, we can't money launder anymore in the U.S. Well, you know, let's go to Europe. Where, and then Europe was um, an ideal location because we just got a new currency, the euro, which so, you know, the, the, the way the European Union was functioning was ideal. There were no barriers, uh, there were no control from one country to another. You know, the market was large enough, the euro was a, a brand new currency. And above all, we did not have any legislation, uh, any anti-money laundering legislation or, or any legislation similar to the Patriot Act. So each country had different legislation, but you know, they were very weak. 
So in reality, the Patriot Act, instead of stopping um, terror money being cir circulating around the world, but also money laundering, it simply shifted the epicenter of this activity from the United States to Europe. Now, um, but at the same time, terrorism kept growing uh, in reality from 9-11 uh, uh, to date we have frozen only $125 million of terror money. The majority of this money has been frozen in the first six months after 9-11. Now, in 2005, I chaired this uh, group of experts on uh, terrorist financing, and we worked for six months uh, basically tracking the money in order to find a solution to the problem. And um, what we did, we actually put forward a proposal whereby you know, the, the Patriot Act was going to be scrapped. Uh, um, a sort of uh, international body was going to be created in order to monitor the transaction of different currencies, not only of the dollar, um, to, to bring about a sort of um, cohesive uh, international policy in order to fight terrorist financing. And the Bush administration, of course, which was in power at the time, you know, did not even take into consideration one of these uh, suggestions. Uh, so that was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, um, a waste of time. But, um, but the problem uh, remained, because you know, the Patriot Act is still uh, in place. Uh, terrorism, as you know, has not stopped. On the contrary, actually, the terrorist activity around the world has increased. And the unit cost of a terrorist attack today is much lower than it was uh, in 2001. Now, if you think about it, just executing 9-11 uh, cost about half a million dollars. Um, the attack took place a few days ago in uh, the tube in Moscow probably cost uh, a fraction, an a very small fraction of that amount. So, we are still facing this problem. Um, now, the reason why all of this is happening is because the Bush administration reaction to 9-11 was um, very much single-minded. It was al also uh, a sort of unilateral reaction. So the United States decided to pass the Patriot Act, did not consult anybody. They did not talk to the Europeans who actually had a much um, better understanding of terrorism and its finances. But the reason why all of this happened is because in reality, the, what the Bush administration really wanted to do was not so much bring Osama bin Laden to justice or stop terrorist financing as much as implement a plan, which was a plan to relaunch the role of America within the international community as you know, the most important and hegemonic power. Now, all of this is contained in the project for the new American centuries, which um, is a sort of blueprint uh, of the vision of the future of the neoconservative, uh, um, which was uh, uh, created under the supervision of Dick Cheney. Among this um, project, we find one key point, which was the decision to go into Iraq to bring about uh, a regime change at any possible cost. <clears throat> so 9-11 became a sort of um, opportunity to carry out this kind of policy. And therefore, in 2003, we actually went to war in Iraq uh, um, on the basis of false information. Now, what I want you to reflect uh, now, um, and this is what links this story to the present, is how did the US actually funded this kind of um, war and very, very strong uh, economic uh, effort. As I told you before, you know, the money laundering was not any, lo any longer in circulation inside the US economy. The truth is that the funding took place by selling uh, government bonds uh, in the international markets. So basically getting into that. Um, and I remind you that Bush came to power in 2000 uh, without a budget deficit. On the contrary, Clinton left a very small surplus. So the, the best way to sell government bonds on the international market and be competitive is to cut interest rate. 
If you cut interest rate, the value of the bond rises. Now, from 9-11 to um, the summer of 2003, when they thought that the war in Iraq was basically finished, interest rate in the United States grows from 6% to 1.2%. This is the time in which we find also the bubble of the subprime taking place and inflating beyond any imagination. This is the time in which banks, because they had you know, interest rate basically coming down continuously, started to give free credit to everybody, including to people they actually could not afford to, to get it. So um, that's the link that we find between terrorism on one side and the current crisis. In reality, the, the bubble burst because the system had been based upon a constant diet of low interest rates. And this is when the world economy was actually overeating. This is a, took place at the time in which actually interest rates should be increased instead of decreased. Now, so the, the credit crunch uh, very much is related to the fact the United States needed desperately to place uh, this kind of debt. You know, and we're talking about $4 trillion. This is the debt accumulated during the Bush administration from 2001 to, um, to basically the day he left the White House. But then, you know, what is the relationship between uh, this kind of debt and what is happening today? I mean, today we see that uh, uh, the relationship between the United States and China is getting tougher and tougher. And uh, this is quite risky for the world economy because we are on very shaky ground. The reason why we haven't gone into a major depression is because one country, China, has continued to grow and has continued to supply us with cheap products. And the reason why this relationship at the moment is shaky is based upon the fact that the country that uh, bankrolled this $4 trillion uh, needed by the U.S. to fight this war uh, is actually China. China bought uh, up to 2009 75% of the issue of Treasury bonds of the United States. In 2010, uh, has gone down to 5%. So the U.S. is actually funding uh, its uh, debt uh, either domestically or through other countries, uh, Japan being one. Uh, the tension between the two countries is based upon, as you read in the newspaper, is based upon the willingness of the US to do anything to force China to unpeg its currency to the dollar. Uh, because of course, the Chinese um, do have pegged the currency to the US dollars in order to defend that kind of debt that they have accumulated. So imagine if the Ravimbi appreciates and the dollar depreciates, uh, all those uh, four trillion that the Chinese actually have uh, will lose uh, in terms of values. It's very easy to understand that. But at the same time, of course, pegging the Ravimbi to the US dollars allows the Chinese to, to continue to be competitive with their products on the international market. While the US dollar, of course, coming down has been very, very good for the US uh, exports. In fact, the trade balance is positive when the you know, trade balance was actually negative in 2005 and 2006. So the policy of the US at the moment is the policy of a country which is um, really in a big, big trouble and is desperately trying to solve its economic troubles by imposing certain kind of condition to other countries and these other countries. Because today, as China is the case, because today are much, much stronger than they were in the past, are basically saying no. Now, this is very serious, meaning if we go down the road of protectionism, which is exactly what is happening. And it's not only the United States, it's also uh, Europe is doing the same thing. In order to defend their own, our own products uh, from the cheap Chinese products, and if the Chinese retaliate as they've done, and I think the Google story is very interesting uh, because it's taking place in a particular moment in which the relationship between China and the United States uh, are at a very low point. I mean, the Chinese 
I just came back from China. I was there for three weeks. The Chinese are trying to impose harder and harder condition to Western business in order to do business in China as a sort of retaliation for what is happening in the United States. So it's a very delicate, very delicate situation. So to conclude, I think that if we go down the protectionist route, if this relationship between China and the US, which are vital for our economy, actually fall apart, we may risk to end up in a situation very similar to the Great Depression. The Great Depression in reality was not caused by the crash of 29. It was actually caused by the protectionism, which was applied after the crash of 29. Now, if we go down that road, the truth is that Osama bin Laden will have won his war because the reason why 9-11 took place is to destroy the power of the United States, not only in economic terms, but also in the political terms, to destroy that role, the symbol that the United States always had of democracy and freedom. And if we go down the protectionist route, I am afraid that this is what is going to happen. And I don't think we should let this happen at all. I mean, we should do something about that. Because otherwise, you know, we will live in a world that will not be the one we know who has been reshaped by an individual, Osama bin Laden, and a bunch of religious fanatics, you know, the terrorists. Well, thank you. Okay, we'll take some questions. Uh, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, just a question about, so you ended the note saying that we should really do something about this. How do you balance all the internal pressures coming from the United States, from the different lobbies to protect their production within there, um, with the need then for the United States to get better relationships with China? Obviously, given the fact that in the United States, it's a government which is um, accountable to the electorates, and they have their own pressures, whereas the Chinese can afford to really take much longer term, <coughs> much longer term positions um, on their policy. Well, I, I think that uh, an organization like Google, for example, can do a lot uh, because, you know, you, I mean, you're, you're on the, the net. Uh, I mean, I believe that most of the true information actually circulating uh, in the net is not um, through the newspapers anymore. I think people should be educated. Now, the story I told you, um, it is quite complex, but it's not very difficult to understand. Um, and yet, I haven't read a story like this in any newspapers. I mean, nobody is linking this, this phenomenon, but the truth is that you can link it uh, using data and using economic information. Um, for the US, uh, I'm afraid that Obama has a very good intention, but the people who are advising him are the same people that <laughs> in the 1990s did the deregulation. So the, we need a major change of also of advisor, a new vision of, of the economy. And the truth is that the US should accept the fact that perhaps it's not any longer you know, the most important economy and take some steps. Um, one could be to reorganize uh, the monetary system I mean, the dollar can't be the reserve currency of the world anymore. We can't have a reserve currency, a, a currency that depreciates regularly, month after month after month. I mean, people that hold that, that currency in the end. You know, this is why gold has gone up so much. I mean, a lot of people, in fact, are buying gold in order to protect themselves because the dollar is coming down. The euro is doing the same thing. So, I mean, it's, it's quite serious. Situation. So I would think that the best thing would be to get economists together, politicians, in order to have a new Bretton Woods, uh, whereby China plays a very important role. But I don't see this happening. I mean, there's not that willingness, exactly as in the, the 1929 crisis. Thank you very much for coming, it's very interesting. Um, one question on terrorism, because you mentioned the, the cost of carrying out 9-11 um, and then the cost of, relative cost to it, carrying out the bomb attacks in, in Moscow. 
I'm always surprised to when these news come that actually this is not happening more often. And I wanted to ask you, do you know why that is? I mean, if I were a, a, a terrorist, I would be doing things like that every week. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think they have, they, have, they, have, they have the means and they definitely have the resources and the people no, that's a very good to question. do this. Yeah. Well, I mean, something like this happens every day in certain countries, Pakistan, for example, Afghanistan, Iraq. So what we're seeing after 9-11 is the concentration of terrorist activity in a part of the world, which, of course, there was no terrorists before. Um, so we're talking about the Central Asia. Um, and then, of course, the Middle East, where we have had terrorists for <coughs> decades. But the reason why they're not doing so much is because they're not very good at it. So. The organization I describe you, the Red Brigades, doesn't exist anymore. I mean, today, the model of a terrorist organization is very, very different. So the, it's a virtual kind of terrorism. Um, a lot of these people get recruited through the net. They actually don't go through a proper training. They don't go through that selection that I was rejected <laughs> to. Right? So they are amateurs. I mean, think about you know the guy, for example, that the when was it the 26th of um, December was uh, lighting a match uh, on a plane, sitting next to three other people in order to blow <laughs> the explosive that was in his shoes. Why didn't he go to the toilet to do it? You know, th this is I, I know this seems <laughs> very logical to us, but a lot of these people are fanatics. A lot of these people are not very smart. And that's why they get recruited, and this is why they get indoctrinated. Thankfully, there's a big correlation between fanatism and just plain stupidity. There is, yeah. absolutely. I mean, to be honest, I, <laughs> of all the people I've interviewed, I mean, I also interviewed members of the Al Zarqawi group for another book I wrote, and, uh, and most of them, to me, sounded not very, very smart. But then you get the leaders who are really smart. But yes, I mean, who would become a terrorist? I mean, you know, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, uh, th does it make sense to become a terrorist? Have you ever seen a terrorist that actually succeeded in doing something? Yes, okay, okay. you have a situation like Fidel Castro, but it's a completely different context. Anybody that today thinks that can bring down the United States or, you know, the United Kingdom by you know, blowing himself up in a tube, it's stupid. It's not going to happen. Just following that train of thought, did you find out more about why your friend joined the Red Brigade? Oh, yes. My friend, my friend joined the Red Brigade uh, because she actually um, thought that Italy was a bloc democracy, which is true. I mean, we had the same government for 35 years. Um, and today, we'll continue to have the same government for another 35 years. <laughs> only the name of the, the leader has changed. Uh, and she thought that the only way to unblock uh, the democracy, the, this block democracy was through um, the armed struggle. But she was recruited uh, by um, her boyfriend. And apparently, she was targeted by this guy. So this guy was trained in order to seduce her to recruit her because she worked at the Ministry of Defense. And she was the person in charge of the route that every day a group of key politicians took in order to go to work from home. And you know, she got 35 years in jail for that. How stupid can you be? I mean, You mentioned the three stages of terrorism, um, state-sponsored privatization and globalization. Can you try and have a guess at what's, what the next one will be? <laughs> well, I think what is happening now, actually, is a sort of privatization within the globalization. Um, these small groups, um, I mean, for example, you know, the, again, going back to the Moscow attack, which is the most recent, uh, uh, apparently those two women had been recruited through the internet. They received a very, very basic uh, uh, training, uh, and they self-funded themselves. 
So I would say that this is a sort of privatization model again. And the same thing is uh, the, the July 5th here, um, the July 7th. Um, the, also, the Madrid attack, to a certain extent, was the same. I mean, the idea that uh, terrorist organizations are funded uh, as it was uh, in the 1980s or 1970s by sponsor um, is actually not what is taking place, especially in the West. Now, we do find some groups in Iraq which receive money uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, for sure, we have sponsor that um, um, are sending money in Pakistan and Afghanistan, but these are different kind of terrorism, I would say. These are actually borderline with uh, separatist uh, kind of uh, um, fighting uh, with the civil war, because this is clearly the situation in, uh, um, in Iraq. But talking about the kind of model that is applied in our country, so in the West, uh, I would say that we have a sort of uh, privatization within the globalization. Um, and it's cheap because, you know, people get very scared. I mean, you, you know, the, the Moscow bombing uh, um, was on the front page of every single newspaper. So, and for 24 hours, it was the, the most important news. And so this is the uh, impact, uh, impact of 9-11. You know, because 9-11 was such a tremendous event uh, that really got stuck in our subconscious. Uh, so now each time that something similar happen, you relieve that kind of terrorist uh, you know, mastermind attack, which of course is not the case. But in the governments, of course, help a lot. Because instead of rationalizing, instead of saying, no, in reality, as we said before, that these guys in reality are not doing it very often. So either they're not good or we are very good, but one way or another, you know, we're winning on this front. Now, the governments use this terrorist threat in order to scare us because they have learned that by scaring us, they are able to make us accept certain kind of policy that we would never accept otherwise. More questions? I was I was wondering because um, we mentioned the euro, the dollars, and so on. What what's your opinion on the role of of the UK? Also taking into account that there's an election coming. You know, within terrorism. Yeah, yeah, and economy. <coughs> what do you think of the UK economy situation? <laughs> well, the UK economy is uh, in very bad shape. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Um, well, I I think it'd be interesting to watch. Uh, the campaign uh, in the next weeks. Because you see, to a certain extent, both parties, they have to justify the presence in Iraq. Uh, um, and this is going to be a key issue. Although the justification is very much on ideological terms. You know, we are you know, protecting freedom and democracy and whatever, uh, not in economic terms. But one thing is sure, and, and the public opinion now knows that the reason why we had so many casualties uh, it is because the UK soldiers did not wear the protective uh, equipment that the Americans had. Um, and the reason why they didn't want to wear that equipment until recently is because they were underfunded. They were underfunded also in terms of weapons, they were underfunded in terms of equipment, helicopters. So it'd be interesting to see how this particular aspect of the war, because you know, running a war for a long time is extremely expensive. And even if this war is only fought by professionals, <laughs> the war is very expensive. So it, in a moment like this, where we have a major recession taking place in which the UK economy is not really taking off, uh, I would say that none of the economies is taking off because you know, the, the data that came out yesterday about Germany also are extremely, extremely negative. Uh, um, there's a very high number of small to medium-sized companies in Germany which actually have closed in the last six months because there is not sufficient uh, credit to sustain them. So I would think that something like that, uh, the justification of a war that is so expensive and we're not winning, uh, plus a war that was 
that was born out of uh, a pack of lies uh, should be on the table in uh, the electoral campaign. But I doubted that any of the two parties, I'm talking about the Conservative, of course, and, and Labour, will touch that topic because if they do, you know, it may turn out to be the Pandora box. I mean, it may backfire. The US is out of Iran, not the UK. Sorry? The UK is out of Iran. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's mostly, yeah. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. no, no. no, 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 no. no. They're not in combat, actually. Yes, they are. They are in combat. I, I can guarantee you. You, know, you, you can you see, see, see the bodies coming. Uh, I mean, these guys uh, are in combat. Uh, I mean, no, no, no. I'm talking about Iraq. The U, the UK is at war and is shoulder to shoulder with the US. It's the second largest contingent after the US. I promise you. Unfortunately. Okay, we've got one final question here. Well, first of all, thank you very much. And um, I, I feel that um, it, it would be great if more people were aware of what you just explained to all of us here today. Um, um, I would like to know your opinion about the role that the media is playing um, in this um, war of terror. Um, you've talked about the changes that you would like to see happening in the economy. Um, today, the, the media have succeeded. Um, in, in giving us lunatic reasons behind the war of terror, one of them being religion, of course. Um, what would be the major changes that we need in our media landscape for this to maybe change? I, I think the media is very much responsible for this failure to communicate to the world really what was happening. But in all fairness, I think that um, in certain countries, um, a situation is better in other countries. I mean, clearly, if you talk about a country like Italy, the media is controlled, so, you know, it's very much you can say. But in this country, the media is less controlled. And I think one of the main problems is the fact that today, journalists uh, has to work uh, much more than he did in the past. So he has less time to do a proper research. And on top of that, the spinning, because you know this is all linked to spinning, the spinning came at the moment in which journalists were desperate in order to fulfill all the different tasks that they have to do on a daily basis, the 24-hour media, for example. So in all fairness, I don't think that the media, in, particularly in this country, but also would say in the US, has done uh, purposely a bad job. Um, I think the media was just ill-equipped to do the job properly and continues to be so. Uh, be because to do this kind of research, I mean, I told you, I mean, I started my story 15 years ago, you know, 1993, basically. So it takes a long time to understand the intricacy of, of the system, but also. Isn't that a media choice at the end? Well, I don't think it's a choice. I mean, I think if you are employed, I mean, if you are employed by the Observer today, for example, I mean the Observer, they say that you know make clothes. I mean it used to be a very good paper, but you know, if you employ the Observer and you, the only way to keep your job because you know, there are no money is to write instead of you know one really good article every two weeks with a series of research, but 15 <laughs> mediocre articles. So what are you going to do? I mean, you will do the mediocre. And if somebody like Alistair Campbell you know, calls you and invites you to a nice breakfast uh, and spins you, you know, <laughs> you're going to take those news uh, and you're going to print it. So it's, the problem is the system. The problem is, I think, that the printed media is disappearing. Uh, something new is coming out, which is on the net, and we are in this transition. And unfortunately, these horrible events took place during this transition. And people believed. You see, everybody believed what the, their leader told. I mean, who would have thought the Colin Power, when he went to the Security Council in February 2003, actually said one lie after another? I mean, you know. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm well, the UK has left Iraq, by the way. Sorry? The UK has left Iraq. Like, try to Google it. I mean, <laughs> go to Wikipedia, whatever. Like, they have left. 
Uh, the UK has left Iraq? Huh? Well, maybe Wikipedia has been uh, uh, hacked by the Chinese also. <laughs> yeah. Everything is possible. Everything is possible. But I don't think that, unless you know, they left in the last uh, two hours, uh, I don't think that the UK is not in Iraq anymore. Well, on that point of debate, thank you very much, Les Napoleon. It's been a, a pleasure having you here, and thank you, everybody, for coming.